United States about this is the Holy Land Foundation. Oh, yeah. This was the largest Muslim foundation in the United States, and uh, it was doing good work all over the world, including Katrina relief and other things like that. But one of the things that they focused on particularly was providing food, medicine, schools, hospitals in Palestine. And in particularly, and, and anything Palestinian, I have to say, is a, is a, a hot tick, ticket here to draw government attention. So right after 9-11, the government decided that what they should be doing is shutting down all of the Muslim charities. And they say, why would they want to shut down all the Muslim charities? Well, you just don't know what kind of contacts these people have. And we want to make sure, we want to cut off any chance that any of these people are going to be talking to each other or getting money abroad even though none of them did anything wrong. We, we had no evidence that any of them did. So they shut down the Holy Land Foundation and then they brought material support charges against the directors. And the theory was that these directors had, uh, that the government conceded that no money from the Holy Land Foundation had gone to any designated terrorist organization. Should have ended the whole problem, right? But instead, the government said, look, you gave money to zakat committees in Palestine. And that's what everybody did, including the government, US government. <laughs> US government did that. Uh, big charities, you Red Cross give, did that. Because that was the only f way you could get the money to the people who really needed it. So the US government said, some of those zakat committees, we claim, were controlled by Hamas or Islamic Jihad. Yeah. And so by giving the, but, but you see those were not, none of these designated charitable organizations, none of, none of the Zakat committees were on the designated terrorist list. Should have been okay, even if they were controlled because they weren't on the designated terrorist list. In order to get over that hurdle, the government said yes, but by giving to the, the uh, Zakat committees, assuming they were controlled, that raised the prestige of Hamas who, in, the, in that area. And that was material support for terrorism. God. So raising the prestige of Hamas, even though they had nothing to do with it, was sufficient. And for example, Qassan Alashi, who was the director of the Holy Land Foundation, was given 68 years in jail, which is a life sentence. Uh, and he was put into a special Muslim prison in the middle of the United States called the CMU, a Communication Management Unit. Whoa. And the Communication Management Unit is designed to cut you off from the rest of society. It is as though you were a virus, a, a virulent disease, which if you were came in contact with the rest of the country, the whole country would go crazy. So they just don't want you communicating outside of that communication management unit. And so the, the, the paradigm here you see is they're setting up is that Hassan Alashi was so dangerous as a terrorist that he should not be allowed to communicate. Now, I know his daughter very well. His daughter is a, is a wonderful person. And uh, she goes, has to go out there. I go out there to meet, see my imam from time to time. And I'll tell you, these, these CMUs are just horrible prisons. Um, and I, I don't want to go into it other than to say that this has become one of the focal points of what the government is doing. One, one group of people they've been putting in these communication management units Another group they've been putting into solitary confinement. Oh, that's worse. And the solitary confinement out in the special, uh, the supermax out in Colorado and so on, is very um, difficult. They, they've been put in there sometimes for life, for years. And as we know, under the Geneva Conventions, Absolutely. only 15 days in solitary confinement right. is enough to produce uh, deterioration mentally you begin to lose the ability to speak. You begin to lose the ability to think. Wow. You become panicked. You become, uh, it's a very painful, one, people, one person I, I know that had gone through it described it as a battle every day to not go insane. Wow. To not believe that the voices you're hearing are reality sure. and that the guards are not. They're just a figment of your imagination. You just, you could go insane so easily as he said, it was the only way I could ever get escape from this place would be to go insane. Yeah. Um, and that's the kind of place that they're putting these people. Again, the paradigm is, I think, two things that they're trying to get across. One is, these, the message of these people is so dangerous that we don't want the public to know. The under part of it would be, if the public found out that these people are actually innocent and never did anything, they might suspect that we're doing something wrong. 
And the other thing is we've got to demonize them somehow. We have to make the public think that these are the worst of the worst, the most dangerous people that ever existed. So we will put them in the supermax, because if we didn't, they might think that we are faking it, which we are. In any event, um, I, I just wanted to quickly end with the Darfur case, uh, with the um, Holy Land Foundation case, because it's an interesting example of the kind of legal twist that the government does. In order to one thing that they had to do was to prove that these Zakat uh, committees were in fact controlled by uh, designated terrorist organizations. And they had no proof of that. In fact, it probably wasn't true. So what they did was they brought over Israeli agents and allowed them to testify as experts anonymously. Now I want you to just think about that for a moment. An anonymous expert. <laughs> How do you cross-examine an anonymous expert? You don't know who they are. You don't know what they wrote. You don't know what the basis of their knowledge is. It is though the prosecutor called his own brother and put him on the stand and said, make my case for me. You don't know. This is so far outside what American law is about that it, it is m much more resembling the show trials in Russia. Even they were probably fair. And yet, this practice went all the way up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court did not see anything wrong with this. And it suggests to you where we have gone as a country legally. This would have been unthinkable 10 years ago. And now, this kind of abuse in the legal system is routine. Um, I want to just follow up from the Holy Land case with the Darfur case. This is, you know, I'm in Syracuse, I've got to talk about the Darfur case. Um, and this is. I'd love to follow on from the Holy Land Foundation case because the Darfur case is exactly the, sort of the opposite side of it. Um, he was running a little charity in Iraq, Help the Needy, and uh, he was an oncologist here in Syracuse, a very beloved man, a very generous man. He gave uh, very freely to people uh, all over, and he gave a lot of his own money to help support this foundation. After 9-11, the government came in and closed it down. And then they charged him also with material support. And they, there's a big headline, you know, Governor Pataki gets out there and says, the funders of terrorism have been, have been caught, have been shut off, you know, this is great stuff, big press. And then the government backed up because they realized they had no way to charge him with material support for terrorism because he was financing charities in Iraq. And there were no designated terrorist organizations in Iraq, so Saddam Hussein wouldn't permit it. He was the only terrorist. So they had no, nobody to charge him with. So they sort of backed up, and they, there was this, I remember it was about a two months of confusion as to what they were going to do. And then they said, wait a minute, we've got it, I know. We're going to charge him with Medicaid fraud. That's it, Medicaid fraud, he's an oncologist. So they charged him with this cockamamie theory that he hadn't uh, billed his, his uh, patients, or hadn't billed the government correctly for certain visits because sometimes he was not in the office at the time and it had been done by something, somebody else. But they never claimed that he hadn't given the treatments. He just said it was a wrong billing formula. And in almost every other case that that happens, the government just simply gives him a refund. But this time, this was the most serious thing that ever happened, and eventually they got him convicted of that and he was spent now 22 years in jail. For Medicaid fraud? Then, for Medicaid fraud. Then after that, they put him on the list of terrorists. They said he was one of those terrorists that we got. So he's on there and he's out in the CMU along with, with the other ones. So it, what I like about that and what it illustrates the point is that the government is not concerned about the charges. They will charge you with anything that will stick. What they want to do is to lock the person up because there's just the slightest possibility that this person might be at some time some kind of a security risk. And that's the kind of a game that we were playing. I just want to quickly mention a couple of other cases to just illustrate some of the issues. Uh, one of them I mentioned was free speech. We've had any number of people that have been convicted of material support for terrorism for simply talking. Uh, one of the most famous ones was Samuel Larian. Uh, he was down in Florida and he was, uh, he's a Palestinian. He was an advocate for rights for Palestinians, and he was not quiet about it. He spoke out. So they basically charged him with sounding too much like Islamic Jihad or Hamas. And because he was saying some of the words that they were saying, he said, well, he's obviously a, a, a member of that organization. And so 
Uh, they brought a charge. They went, the uh, case went on for some six months, and the jury wouldn't convict. Would not convict. They, they um, hung on a couple of charges, but most of the major charges he was not convicted on. Whereupon, the government turned around and eventually brought, uh, asked him to appear before a grand jury to testify about the very facts for which he'd been found not guilty. Now, the same prosecutor had done this before in the case of uh, Sabri Bancala, another person who had been found not guilty by a jury in the paintball case in Virginia. And so he brought, called Sabri Bancala before him and asked him about all the things he'd been found not guilty of and then charged him with perjury. What? Yes, and got a conviction for perjury and then got a terrorism enhancement, which in, essentially enhances the sentence by four times. Whoa. And so Sabri Bancala was sent off to jail for 10 years. So Samuel Larian, this is the same prosecutor, yeah. saw what was coming, so he refused to testify before the grand jury. So now he's in, now he was put in jail on that basis. And uh, so this is another one of these cases where the person is essentially being prosecuted for nothing more than free speech. Uh, another one is free association, and you get this all the time, and I'll, I'll give you one of the worst examples of it, just to give you an, a, a flavor of how this works. Uh, Ziad Yagi was a young kid, he knew some other kids from the, uh, the Daniel Boyd family, uh, but very, very slightly. And at one point, he and a friend of his decided to go over to Palestine. He's a Palestinian again, you know. <laughs> and so uh, they were talking, and somehow Daniel Boyd learned that Ziad Yagi was planning to go over to Palestine. And he said to him, you know, why don't you use my ticket agent? I have a ticket agent. I'm going to be over there, too. So. He said fine, and he went and used the ticket agent, paid for the ticket, went over to Palestine, saw his relatives, mm -hmm. hung out on the beach, and came back. Now, Daniel Boyd was later, uh, became very involved in Bosnia. He wanted to protect the Muslims in Bosnia from attack from the Serbs, and so he began to you know, uh, amass weapons and talk to people about it, and the government became concerned, and eventually charged him with material support for terrorism. And they reached out and they saw that he had allowed this kid, Ziad Yagi, to use his account to get some tickets to go to Palestine. So they said, well, if he did that, there's absolutely no question. He must have, Ziad Yagi must have gone to Palestine in order to further this conspiracy to attack Bosnia. So they charged, charged Ziad Yagi with material support for terrorism. Simply guilt by association. There's no other way you can describe it. He was convicted, and now he's spending 43 years in jail. What? Yeah, and a, and a young kid, a very sweet kid, and I happen to know his mother, who's a wonderful person. So um, then I want to go to just one other group, and then I'll, I'm going to move on quickly. But um, I mentioned earlier that peacemaking is a very dangerous thing. This is certainly going to cause you a lot of problems. There's a group out in the Midwest, a group of peacemakers, who went to places like Colombia and to Palestine to try to talk with various sides uh, in, in a conflicted area to get them to be able to talk with each other. And the government, uh, about three years ago now, went into their houses in a coordinated raid all across the Midwest, knocked down the doors, took the computers, took the children's art, took books, took all <laughs> kinds of stuff. And, and took it back and presented it and wanted them to testify before the grand jury about their material support for possible designated terrorist organizations. They have resisted. To, to their credit, they've all sort of stood up and said, we will not testify before the grand jury under any circumstances. And they have generated such public support all across the country, and I'm, I'm wearing their band, Stop FBI Repression, uh, that the, the uh, US attorney has not yet indicted anybody. And three years is a long time for a grand jury investigation. But I think it's really interesting, some things about this are interesting. One of the things they went after were books, literature, even the children's art. They weren't concerned about guns, they weren't concerned about anything else, they were concerned about ideology. Because what all of these cases are about is trying to show that these people are somehow terrorists, they are the other. We have the right to treat them as the enemy. We have the right to strip them of all of their legal rights. And they can only do that by showing that this person said things or did things that would suggest some sort of a terrorist risk. And so that's what uh, they actually go after. It is the thought police going in to see what you are thinking 
and then saying, uh, you know, based on an ideology, you are not a real American, you are the enemy, we can strip you of your legal rights. And this, of course, sounds like things that we've heard before. We've heard this about McCarthy. Uh, how many people here know about COINTELPRO? Oh, good. Well, I won't go through that then, but this to me, as I, as I have analyzed it, it looks to me very much like COINTELPRO coming back on steroids. It is, uh, once after 9-11, essentially all of the restrictions that were placed on the FBI uh, as a result of uh, COINTELPRO were taken off. And they were allowed to go after who they believed was the ideological enemy. And I have to say, all of you would probably qualify in some way or another. So <laughs> just, just remember that. Fortunately, they tend to treat white folks a little bit better than, than Muslims and others. Um, the, another technique that they use is you, you're going to tell me when I'm over time? Am I over time already? No, you're not. Okay. All right. Put me. Uh, one, one of the other things that, um, uh, ways that they go after people is if you, they cannot find a material support for terrorism charge to get you with, they will assign agent provocateurs to talk you into it. Oh, yeah. Oh, and yeah. This, is, this has become very, very popular. We have a number, about half of the cases, I would say, on this board over here. Yeah. Oh, I, sh I should mention, by the way, look, the pink people over here are the peace folks. The green folks are the, um, are the uh, Muslims. There's another batch of red folks over there. That they are the uh, anarchists. So I, I want to just emphasize that. The blue guy's uh, Bradley Manning. And down in the corner here, you'll notice some brown folks. And those are the uh, COINTEL people. And I always, I always want to uh, COINTELPRO people, and I always want to include the COINTELPRO people because I want people to understand that from the COINTELPRO era, there still are people in jail. Still are people in jail. They have never been let out. And if we are going to advocate to let these folks out of jail, there's 155 plus a lot more beside that, we need to bring along and get out all of the other people too. And that includes Mumia Abu Jamal, Fred Ham, uh, uh, Jamil Al Amin, uh, and so on. Um, and that's only the beginning of it. There's a lot more on there. Anyway, I, I wanted to just talk quickly about um, entrapment. Uh, one of the, uh, there are three cases particularly bother me. One of them is the Fort Dix Five. How many people have heard of the Fort Dix Five? Okay, quite a number of you. It, it started when a group of Roofers. These, this is a family of roofers. Uh, went up to the Poconos. Uh, these were they're Albanian, and uh, for a vacation. And they rode horseback and they throw snowballs at each other. And they took films of all of this. And when they went to a public shooting range and they shot guns at the public range that they had rented. And they part of the video here is they they're all standing up there looking very proud and holding up the gun and going Allah Akbar oh no yes on the on the film uh, so they took it down to Circuit City and they had a copy of the film made and the the clerk apparently looked at this film and got, ah, you know Allah Akbar Muslims holding guns this has got to be bad so he gave it to the FBI so the FBI decided to come in and he was they were going to try to get these guys so what they did was they went to they had two friends there's the three Duca brothers and then they had two friends. So one of the agent provocateurs went to the two friends, and he got one of them alone in a car, and they drove around New Jersey, and they eventually drove through uh, Fort Dix, or right past Fort Dix. And he began to talk to him about, you know, how would you go about attacking Fort Dix? Let's say you want to attack Fort Dix. <laughs> and this guy was sort of talking, and they were talking back and forth, as friends would, about it, and he got that all recorded. <gasps> then he goes over to the Duca brothers, and he says, you know, you guys love to shoot, don't you? Yeah, it's kind of fun to go and shoot at the public range. You know? Well, you got to wait in line when you go to the public range. Remember that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wouldn't it be better if you could get yourself some guns? Well, yeah, that would be a lot better, but we can't afford it. Oh, I got a friend who can sell you guns really cheap. Whoa. These, well, we don't want cheap guns. No, no, these are top quality guns, but really, really cheap. You can afford this. <laughs> Whatever you can pay, we'll, we'll do it. So eventually, he got them to agree to buy the guns. And then they put the whole thing together, and they said, this wasn't a, a, uh, a plot, a conspiracy, to attack Fort Dix. Uh, what? And the two friends are going, what? We don't know anything. We don't have any ammunition. We're not going to attack Fort Dix. We don't have any guns. And the Dukas are saying, Fort Dix? Nobody ever said anything about Fort Dix. We don't know anything about it. We were talking about a public shooting range. That was the way Case went to trial. They were all convicted. What? And the Duca brothers were sentenced to life in jail plus 30 years. Uh, 
They will be released 30 years after they're dead. <laughs> down to the New Jersey on many occasions. Um, and they, I think there's a total of 10 or 11 kids in the family now. And all the three brothers are in three separate prisons scattered all over the United States. When this family wants to go visit them, they have to rent a huge van. <laughs> and then they drive to Kentucky, and then to Indiana, and then out to Colorado. It oh, takes two weeks. Yeah. They have nobody working for them. The FBI follows around and, and tries to get the people to cancel contracts with the roofing company. What? It's just, it's a mess. It's an absolute mess. Um, another, another one I just wanted to mention was, uh, this is another one I, I simply, I hate to talk about because I, the, the mother of this defendant lives in, in uh, Albany. And I know her very well. She's a, she's a really good friend. Um, she had a son named Tariq Shaw, who was a famous jazz musician. Yes. He, he actually played at Clinton's inaugural. Anybody know him? Tariq Shaw? Oh, we don't have that many yeah, yeah. jazz folks here. Um, but he also ran a martial arts school. And at some point, some the government got a tip somewhere that this particular book um, bookseller had a way to get money to the Islamic Jihad, I think it was. So they sent somebody in to say, hey, you know, can you get some money over to the Islamic Jihad for me? So the bookseller goes, hey, I don't have anything to do with it. I don't know anything about it. So they kept pressing him, and finally he said, well, why don't you talk to Tariq Shaw? Maybe he knows something. So he goes over, and he tries to talk Tariq Shaw into doing something about getting his money. And Tariq says, I don't know anything about that either. You know, just leave me alone. So the government, and particularly this Agent 4, he was very, very vigorous about this. He kept vigorous. pushing pushing the pro provocateur to do more, get more information. And finally, the, the uh, agent provocateur himself got so frustrated with his handler, his FBI handler, that he went down to the White House and set himself on fire outside what? the White House. Wow. This is, is absolutely bizarre. Fortunately, they had a bucket of water there. They ran out and put him out, and he was OK. Oh, wow. Uh, but now the FBI was really embarrassed about this. Their own guy was setting himself on fire in front of the White House. So it, this sounds like I'm making it up, right? No, I don't know. Yes. <laughs> so this time, they decided they're really going to get him. So they hired another guy to go in and get him. So he goes in, and he says, um, I want to learn how to play jazz. Can you teach me how to play jazz? Oh, yeah, I can teach you. So, he takes lessons for a while. Then he says, oh, God, I, I got kicked out of my house. I'm homeless. Can I come live with you? What? So he says, sure, come on in. Oh, so he moves in, and for two months, as his best friend, he follows him around with a tape recorder, trying to talk him into saying something that would be <laughs> actionable. Oh, God. And finally, after two months, they get a group together of, of guys, and they start to talk about uh, the martial arts school, because he's also running a martial arts school. Yeah. And he's saying, hey, look, would you guys, uh, would you uh, train, uh, if I send some Al-Qaeda agents to you, would you train them? What? And the guy says, I'll train anybody. I, I don't care what they are. Oh, no. And then there was a doctor there with him. And he said, well, if, if we had some Al-Qaeda agents, would you treat him? He said, I'm a doctor. I'll treat anybody. Oh. That was it. That's what they got. So he's spending 22 years in jail. Oh, God. Uh, so these are some of the things that are going on. Um, now, I wanted, uh, we're here kind of about drones, and I just wanted to wrap this up by kind of saying that we're dealing here with the government, I, and I, I want you to understand how far that this has been pushed, the kinds of theories that they're using to basically entrap people who are not doing anything criminal. We call it preemptive prosecution. Right now, they're sending drones abroad to deal with people that they say are a threat to the country. Right. How much confidence do you have that they, that these people that they are assassinating are really guilty of something. No, zero. zero. Right. And you should be. You should be really, don't know what doing. have zero confidence because just as they are locking up innocent people in this country, they are assassinating innocent people abroad. This is preemptive assassination. Yeah, it might be. Yep. And I want you to understand that. And I think particularly, one, one last thing I'm going to mention, then I'm going to sit down is that we are dealing with a government in which honor, truth, is simply a foreign word. When it comes to these kind of issues, they do not tell the truth. And I think the best example was when Bush really, really wanted to, to torture people. But it was illegal, and he knew it, and everybody else knew it. So he got a very junior person in the council, uh, council's office, John Yu, 
to write an opinion, because I think, frankly, you was the only person ambitious enough to write the opinion because it couldn't be written. <laughs> and so he wrote an opinion that said that you know people could torture. It actually didn't say that they could torture because he couldn't say that, but he said yeah. that if you do this, this, and this, and they don't okay. die, it's not torture. But if they die? <laughs> but the, he, yeah. if they don't die, then it's not torture. If they do die, it's but because is, uh, the opinion was so bad, yeah. they classified it so that nobody could see it. So that all you could see was, we have a classified opinion. Now, eventually, when Obama came in, that's the only good thing that he's done so far, is he leaked the opinion. He sort of put it out there. And people were so horrified at how horrible this opinion was. It was so badly written. It was so, he miscited things. He had taken, put words that in judges' mouths that simply weren't there. It was, a, it was a horrible opinion. That everybody, it was immediately withdrawn. Immediately withdrawn. What they didn't stop doing was torturing. They continued to torture. They put in a patch, they fixed it up, they tried to figure out some way, which is, I think it's also presently classified. I, I don't think we know the basis on which they're doing it. But that is the level of honesty within this government. And now, the drone warfare, of course, is being conducted on the same basis. There is an opinion, a legal opinion, that says that this is okay, but it's classified. The only thing we have is a white paper that argues some of the things, which, and, and it's a very pointless, flimsy argument. So I, I just want you to understand that from a legal point of view, the government's case is and always has been and always will be completely unsustainable. And until they put out the opinions that justify the kinds of things that they're doing, we should have no, should not pay any attention to what, uh, give no credence, let me put it, to the kinds of positions they're taking on this, because it's simply, it's a fraud. Thank you. He was considered a high-level operative within Al-Qaeda with close connections to the bosses. They said that he was a principal commandant of a training camp of terrorists in Afghanistan. He was arrested in Lahore, Pakistan, following a massive manhunt. Like, I think they had like hundreds of like FBI agents and Pakistani police uh, out uh, searching for him. And uh, at the time of his arrest, he was mortally wounded and nearly dead. Uh, over the next four years, they somehow revived him, and over the next four years, he was imprisoned in a series of CIA black sites before he was finally moved to Guantanamo as one of the 14 high-value prisoners in 2006. Um, so uh, it turns out, uh, once they had him in Guantanamo and he had a lawyer, that Abu Zubaydah was a gatekeeper, essentially a security guard, at the training camp which he was thought to govern. He had received a serious head wound back in the 80s fighting uh, with, uh, you know, the American uh, war on Russia, and um, his short-term memory was damaged, and his verbal capabilities were damaged. So he kept a diary with detailed information on what went on every day, because otherwise he didn't know from one day to the next what was going on at all. In fact, I kept thinking of that movie, 50 First Kisses, where every morning she wakes up and has to read her diary to find out who her friends are. So um, he, at any rate, Abu Zubaydah was, uh, he re after he recovered from the wounds, he was treated very badly and he was water waterboarded 83 times. This guy with no short-term memory, has no idea of what's going on, during the early period of incar his incarceration. He was beaten chained in stress positions that amount to torture for long periods of time. He was housed in a cell too small to lie down in. He uh, had his clothes taken away for months on end. He was subjected to extremes of heat and, heat and cold without his clothes. Uh, Videotapes of his interrogations were so terrible that they were destroyed by the CIA during the Bush administration so that no one would know. And uh, you can find all this out on Wikipedia. So. How do we know about Abu Zubaydah's treatment? Well, it turns out that he has some kind of visual memory, and he drew detailed pictures of his experiences for his lawyers at Guantanamo. And he showed the things that had been done to him in these pictures. So um, now I'm gonna move on to another person, a totally different scenario. Uh, again, though, a uh, pretty hard case to make. And this is a young man named Majid Khan. Now, Majid Khan, uh, his family moved to the United States of Virginia at, when he was 16, and he finished high school here. He spoke excellent American English. 
and uh, he went back to Pakistan to get married. And of course, his family was there. So, uh, you know, his uh, uncles and aunts and cousins. So he did marry there, actually, but he ran into um, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who I will henceforth refer to as KSM, like uh, oh, yeah. the yeah, right. establishment. And it turns out that um, KSM, when he was arrested, was waterboarded 81 times. And he named everybody he'd ever had a conversation with. <laughs> Anybody whose name he remembered, he named them. And he said, yes, they're a terrorist, yeah. too. So all these people were hunted down oh. in Karachi. And um, uh, so you can tell that this guy's a blabbermouth. And it's really hard to tell how much of what you know, he actually says he did, whether he even did it himself. But these people around him were young kids who were like kind of awed by the stories he told. And uh, Majid Khan was one of them. And so uh, he was arrested, and I guess I'll go back to my script here, otherwise I'll be lost. KSM, uh, so KSM also liked to throw money around and talk, as well as talk the big talk. And um, it's possible he was instr instrumental in planning and implementation of 9-11 attacks, but the people around him a couple years later appear to have been harmless dupes. Because he bragged about his connection with 9-11, he sounded powerful. Many had already been sucked into the war on terror by the passions that were inflamed by the merciless attacks on civilian and soldier alike in Pakistan and Afghanistan. Uh, Muhammad liked to work with people who had connections in the United States. And Majid Khan, for instance, uh, I just told you his story, but uh, he had uncles there who he later said were Al-Qaeda operatives. What? But they were actually arrested and no one could uh, say that that was true. And in fact, it turned out that they were just conservative Muslims, of whom there are many in Karachi. Um, so when he, Khan was arrested, they detained them all. And they released everyone except him, because he actually talked to Khalid Muhammad and had been in, indicated by KSM that he might have done something. So uh, he's accused of participating in a number of unconsummated plots including one to return to the U.S. and blow up gas stations. It turns out that his father owned a gas station in the U.S., so KSM thought he'd be an expert on gas stations. However, when KSM sent him out to figure out how to blow up a gas tank, he went and asked his brother. And his brother thought it was a dumb question, and he said, well, you know, I, he didn't give him any information, actually, because he didn't think it was a smart enough question, actually, to merit an answer. <laughs> So um, it appears that um, KSM was just like coming up with plots to talk about with these people, kind yeah, of like sure. the, uh, the uh, FBI operatives who set people up in this country. He just talked to them about whatever came to mind, whatever they were doing, and he would think of a way to make that a plot back in the United States. In fact, uh, another person who talked to KSM and paid dearly for it is Jose Padilla. Oh, now, KSM, talked about some plots with him, and he actually gave him some money. And what did Jose do? He went back to Cairo and lived there with his wife until he ran out of money and had to go home to mom. <laughs> so when he ran out of money, he went home to his mother, except that he never made it, because they picked him up at the airport due to the fact that KSM had named him oh. as a fellow slaughter against the United States. Of course, we're talking about people who are just, you know, like, you know, when you're angry and you have a conversation, well, I'd like to do this or that, you know, and plus he was passing out money to these young people. So Khan supposedly engaged a little more deeply in Al-Qaeda while in Pakistan and Padilla, actually, but the stories don't add up. He participated in a fake plot to implement a suicide bombing against Pervez Musharraf. But he said that his uncles had already told him that the vest wasn't armed, so he wasn't afraid. He just went in and came out. Um, the vest, uh, they made a big fuss about it in the FBI, uh, and they said that it had been prepared by this horrible terrorist named Hassan Ali bin Atash. So I looked up uh, this guy in uh, Wikipedia, my first source, <laughs> And it said that um, he was arrested uh, almost a year before uh, Majid Khan was arrested, and that at the time he was 16 years old. He was one of the child prisoners in Guantanamo, and he was never charged with a crime. So this is the terrible terrorist that uh, you know uh, radicalized Majid Khan. 
And then they said uh, that Khan uh, carried some money to a Malaysian terrorist from KSM to support a hotel bombing that did occur in Malaysia. But the timing of his trip is off, even in their own documents. I got this out of a, a state document by the interrogators. There's a footnote that says that the Malaysian police followed the money trail, and it turned up that the money came at a later date in US dollars from somewhere else. So Majid Khan had nothing to do with it. Whatever he thought he was doing, he didn't. And uh, since this 23-year-old boy who was having fun talking to uh, KSM was another one who was waterboarded 80 some odd times, it's hard to know what he would have uh, said that he did. You know, it could be anything. So um, the main story around Khan is that um, while he was over there uh, having all these fun discussions, he let his travel visa from the United States wear out. Oops. At, oops, right. So there's an easy way and a hard way to deal with this. He, if, you know, he could deal with the government and go through all kinds of hassle and risk being rejected, or he could just pretend that he never left the United States and get somebody to open a post office box for him in the U.S. and just you know, maneuver the papers through there. And that way they would give him the papers easily, just fill out the form, send them from the U.S., and poof, it comes back. So. Um, that's what he decided to do. And it turns out that um, another innocent person is accused of opening that post office box for him. Now that person might not even be the one who did it because again, you know, her name might have been given to him and he might have said, yeah, sure, that's the one. It's really hard to tell when these people are under such horrific torture what the details are, other than the fact that I do believe that um, he wanted to open that post office box and that, you know, it was a simple favor for another immigrant to help him out. Because it's a minor uh, a violation of basically the immigration codes. It's not a terrorist act. So um, anyway, uh, one more thing about Majid Khan before I move on, uh, before I pass the uh, microphone away, is that after nine years in Guantanamo, now he's in his early 30s, he's been through all this horrific torture, he confessed to everything they ever accused him of, and uh, he was given a sentence of a few more years after which he would be freed. Of course, he doesn't know that they'll honor it, but he's hopeful, and apparently he was doing victory dances in court, because he finally, he thought he'd finally found a ticket to get out of there. And um, so he testified against a, a guy named Amar al-Baluchi, another one who was, uh, again, knew KSM and he talked about him, but it's hard to say what he really did. And um, so the plea deal occurred after this man, uh, Majid Khan, at, picked up as a youth, tortured. He spent a third of his life in Guantanamo and the black prison sites he was at before Guantanamo. So I'm wondering how much validity it has. But the mailbox plot was actually blamed on an innocent uh, woman who had uh, no terrorist associations, no reason to be deemed a terrorist, and it's the linchpin of uh, a ter terrible treatment that re she received, and her name is Afia Siddiqui. And uh, whether or not the story is true, my point is that whether or not the story is true, it wasn't an act of terrorism, and therefore it's irrelevant. And I think we have to look at these stories in that light that you know, immigrants are vulnerable, they're trying to survive in this country. And uh, so this should not be used against them. And Joe's gonna talk about Afia. Can I just say something? Yes, you the, sorry. Um, I'm, I'm the, national, the director of the National Coalition to Protect Civil Freedoms and we are trying to help uh, all of these families and the prisoners and also bring education around the country. And we're having an event on Friday uh, uh, this coming Friday down in Washington, D.C. called the Scapegoated and Buried Alive Campaign. And I just have some posters for it and I just wanted to pass them out so you can kind of see it. This is where the families of the victims are gonna to get together for the first time and try to raise their voice. And we're hoping that we're gonna get a critical mass out of this of people similar to what happened in Argentina where they held up the pictures of the lost ones. Thank you. In some sense they seem like they're separate from the anti-war movement, but they're not, just like 
Steve talked about preemptive prosecution. People didn't commit any crime, but they are prosecuting them with the idea that perhaps they might. And preemptive assassination, which is what we're doing with these drones, we're killing people, no trial, no, uh, no anything. But you have to think of the Iraq war, that was a preemptive war. Uh, the idea was that Iraq didn't threaten the United States, but someday it might. They might get these weapons of mass destruction, which was all a fabrication anyway, and someday they might. So we do all this preemptive stuff now. This has changed the whole concept of legal system and the whole society and civil society that, that we live in. And it makes it like an Alice in Wonderland, almost non-real thing. But the reason we're going after these Muslims are the same reason that the Nazis went after the Jews. It was scapegoating and a way to build up a case for the kinds of wars that they want to do. Resource wars, wars for geopolitical positioning against vis-a-vis -vis China, um, and the huge amounts of money that are being made off of these wars. You blow up a bomb, then they have to build another bomb. You just think of where, where our unemployment level would be if it wasn't for these wars. Just the soldiers in the military, the people in the prisons, the people who keep them in the prisons, the people who work in the military industrial complex because we blow up the bombs and they have to make more bombs. What would be a real um, uh, unemployment rate in, in this country? And it says a lot about um, our position, our economic position in, um, right now. So I want to talk about the case of Afia Siddiqui. Um, uh, a long time ago, UNAC, I'm, I'm the national co-coordinator of the United National Anti-War Coalition. And we, under, we started formulating the idea of a war abroad, wars abroad, but also that there was a domestic component. We called it the wars at home because we started seeing these attacks on Muslims. And when they attack a Muslim, they're the most vulnerable because of the racism and anti-Islamophobia that has been raised in this country. So it's easy to attack them and say, okay, we're gonna use secret evidence against these people. We're not gonna allow them to, to have the same legal rights that everybody else. But once they establish that, just like they establish drones in other countries can kill people, they hear they say they only wanna use it for surveillance. There's already a manufacturer that has made a drone that can kill people in the United States, um, that can fit in the back of a police car. Um, and uh, someday you can be sure they will use it. So similarly, when they go after the Muslims, then they can attack all of our civil liberties. And, and Steve talked about some of the anti-war activists. Joe Eisenbacher, who's up on that thing there, he happens to be on the um, uh, um, executive committee of UNAC, my organization. Um, uh, Sarah Martin, she's on the coordinating committee of UNAC, and all those other 24 people that are up there, the anti-war activists, are all in committees, all in organizations that are associated with our um, uh, coalition. So once they establish this precedent with the weakest link, they can go after all of us. So we have to stop it at the weakest link because we are all gonna be vulnerable, um, and everybody else in this country. But I wanna talk about Afia Siddiqui. Um, <coughs> Uh, Judy and I and some other people in this room were over in Pakistan with the Code Pink tour um, this past uh, fall. And um, we were able, uh, Afia's sister, uh, Fazia Siddiqui, who's a, a neuro um, a doctor who deals with neurological problems, very w respected doctor in, in um, Pakistan. She spoke to our group and then later on Judy and I went down to Karachi and met with the family and saw the incredible breadth of support for Afia Siddiqui. Afia Siddiqui is a young woman who was educated in the United States, young Pakistani woman educated in the United States. She went to MIT and then she got her doctorate from Brandeis University and also wow. some, did a thing on some neurological thing. She was married in the United States to another Pakistani and had two children here, so there are two of her children are um, American citizens. She went back to Pakistan and had a third ch child. And one day she took a trip from Karachi, um, her home, uh, to Islamabad to visit relatives. And all people know was she left the house in 2003 with her three children, ages six months to six years, and wasn't seen again. So her family started calling up the Pakistani authorities and the US authorities. Now this was also at a period where some of the uh, people at Guantanamo got caught up because people were selling other people. They were saying, if you know a terrorist, you can turn him in and we'll give you money. So somebody who has a 
a problem with their neighbor, turned them in, all sorts of people. So these weren't, these turned out, and by and large, to not be anything to do with terrorism. But people needed the money in a poor country, and they might have had grudges against whoever or whatever, and it helped destroy the whole society over there, this whole concept. Um, so Afia is gone in 2003, and for five years her family's calling everybody, saying, where's Afia? Where's Afia and the children? Where's Afia and the children? And uh, they all said, oh, we don't know. We have no idea. Pakistani authorities, well, now they, they um, kidnapped her on the behest of the United States and turned her over to the U.S. What? The U.S. denied, denied it, denied it, denied it. But in 2008, five years later, after her family thought she and her kids were dead, there was a British reporter that was at Bagram Air Force Base. Now, Bagram Air Force Base, you know, it's called an Air Force Base, but it's a prison where people are tortured. Um, and they said, we understand there was one woman at Bagram Air Force Base, and we were told it was Afia Siddiqui. So the family recontacted the U.S. and they said, yeah, we, we have her. And there's a whole story about what happened there. And uh, She got out at one point and was back in. Uh, she was called prisoner 650, and uh, the male prisoners there said they would hear the screams from Afia Siddiqui. And at one point they went on a, um, a hunger strike. Um, as a way of supporting Afia Siddiqui and, Af and this woman that was screaming and, and so forth. This is what your government is doing around the world. Understand that. Um, and um, so they said, we're taking her from Afghanistan, we're bringing her to the United States, um, and we're putting her on trial. Because apparently, while she was waiting to be interrogated or being interrogated, what they said happened and what she denies is she reached out from a curtain that she was put behind. Now here's a four foot 11 woman. Yeah. Grabbed a gun of one of the interrogators and tried to shoot him. Oh. Now I don't like shooting anybody, but anybody who's stolen from their home with their kids and taken by this foreign force to Afghanistan where she's interrogated in a place which is notorious for torture, if she grabbed a gun and shot anybody, I'd say she has a right. Yeah. Um, but she denies it. And they said, well, there was a hole. They had a hole in the wall. They said, this looked like a bullet hole. Other people said, it doesn't look like a bullet hole. She was brought here. She was convicted on trial. And uh, she is now spending 86 years in Carswell Prison in Texas. What? And she's been in solitary confinement ever since. Um, well, um, in 2008, her son, who was the oldest, who was six when, when they kidnapped him, he's now five years later, was uh, found in Afghanistan and returned to the family. In 2010, the daughter who was four when kidnapped, and now it was um, uh, seven years later, she was 10, uh, was dropped off, nobody knows by who, at their family's house in Karachi, uh, Pakistan. She no longer spoke her native language of Urdu and only spoke English with an American accent. What do you know? And the six-month-old son has never been heard of, but the older boy says he remembers when the kidnap happened that he was thrown on the ground and he was bleeding from his head. Oh. So the assumption is that he was killed. Oh. Um, so this is the case, and it's a case that the anti-war movement, uh. the anti-drone movement has to take up. We have to tell people what is going on in this country. And among some people, it's been a reluctance to defend these Muslims because they, there's a prejudice against Muslims here. And we can't allow that prejudice to stop us. We will never bring peace to this world as long as those kinds of, that kind of racism, those kinds of chauvinism that we have are exceptional in the United States and exceptions and we don't, um, as long as that's allowed to, to be, we will never bring peace to this world. We will never bring peace to this world. We must stand up for these people, and we must fight for them, and we must let people know this story, because they will not know this story. No. It's a famous story in Pakistan. At one point, there was a demonstration in Pakistan of one million people for Afia Siddiqui. Whoa. When we were in Karachi, all over there were signs. There was a sign that said, Afia 86 years for Afia, bullshit. That was my favorite. Yeah. But all over there were handwritten signs, there were painted signs on walls, and, and printed signs for Afia Siddiqui. The anti-war movement has a tremendous ally in the Pakistani people. We saw that when we went over there. They're all against drones. 
They don't like our government. Tremendous ally. Together, if we understand that connection, and if we can bring together and defend Afia, we have Wednesday night conference calls with some of us now, um, with Afia's family in Pakistan and people in South Africa that are, where there's also a big campaign for her. For her, we need to bring these facts out. We need to tell people. We need to tell people about all the people on the walls there. That's part of our movement, because. Um, this will, can mobilize people in ways that will defend our own civil liberties and it will, it will tie us to strong allies all over the world. And with those allies, no matter all the wealth, all the money, all the media control that our government has, it could never stand against a growing population saying what is happening is unjust and wrong and we must fight against it. And that's the way we're going to eventually win this. So that's Afia's case. Now let me just say one last thing in ending. There's another prisoner in Coswell Prison. Um, her name is Lynn Stewart. She is also a coordinator of, um, on the coordinating committee of um, uh, UNAC. Um, she was arrested because she defended the blind sheik and she did something which the government told her not to do and she did it anyway. Send out a press release. Ooh. The government is afraid of press releases. They are afraid of the truth getting out. That's why they have CMUs. That's why they go after Bradley Manning and Julian Assange. Right. The truth is against their interest. We must continue to speak the truth to power and that's the way we will win. But we've had a victory in the case of Lynn Stewart. Right. We've been sending out petitions that send letters all over to all sorts of people. She has severe cancer. Yeah. She was originally sentenced to 24 years for send, uh, 24 yeah. months for sending out this, or I think it was 28 months, for sending out this press thing. The government said, that's not enough. We want to show any lawyer that wants to defend any of these people that they better not do it. So they said, we want more time for her. So the judge resentenced her to 10 years. 71 year old, this woman went into prison for 10 years and she had cancer, which they didn't treat and have not been treating well. Now her cancer is stage four, it's in her bones, it's in her backs, and it's in her lungs. She's in a very serious ca case, but her doctors say if she can get out and get aggressive treatment, she, she can survive for a period of time. She couldn't get that in prison, so we've been fighting for compassionate release, and the, the warden first said no, no way. Now after the big campaign that was waged in her on her behalf, he's said, um, I'm supporting compassionate release for Lynn Stewart. It's not the last of it, but hopefully she'll be out, and hopefully at the next conference, Lynn Stewart will be with us and tell her own story. Thank you. Thank you.